This is the space I'm going to be recording in that we're going to be putting the acoustic treatment in. So the lighting's not perfect in here. We're going to get a couple more little lamps. But in the meantime, what you can see is that I have this editing area here where I can do a little bit of production. And then right next to it, I've got my microphones. I typically use the David H. Lawrence technique of addressing the mic directly across it. That's the red one you see. But George has suggested that after I get the pieces in place, I should also give it a try to do an overhead technique. So I'll do that too, and that's why I've put the blue mic up there. In between those two, that's my little impromptu stand. So I use my Surface Pro down here for editing, and then I just pick it up and stick it in the stand, and that becomes my screen for reading, and it's also my device for recording. It's a fanless Surface Pro, so no noise. In the meantime, we've also got these curtains that are soundproof. There's actually a layer of two of them. They came in a pair, so I just stack them on top of each other. A lot of thought went into this room. This is on the side of the house that's right next to the neighbors. It's a solid wall with no real windows on that side. It's the furthest away from our HVAC outdoor units. And it has a solid core door leading into the room, so outside noise isn't really going to be a problem. In the meantime, though, for my podcast, Sometimes we like to sit on the futon and do short videos about episodes that are coming up. So I've laid up a green screen here, and that will make it really easy for us to just sit down and go. And then over here in the corner, George had recommended that if I have bookshelves, that's a really great kind of acoustic stop, if you will. So the fact that I've got these shelves with unevenly spaced books is going to come in really handy for the sound quality. And then as we come around over here, the vents up here are for the air conditioning. The air conditioning system is actually a very quiet unit. We paid extra to get an upgrade to the AC so that we wouldn't have a problem. But even so, if I needed to turn it off for recording, the console is right around the corner. And then I may go ahead and put some sort of acoustic paneling treatment on these closet doors as well. As you can see, there's not a lot of bare wall space for paneling, but there are some areas where it's really going to be important. The ceiling cloud over my recording and editing area is going to be key. That's why it's going to be four foot by six foot. But then here on the wall behind where I'm talking, and some of the other walls in here. I mentioned before that uh, I did canvas, and I put them together in college, and it was kind of fun. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. We're still getting everything unpacked here, so this is our everything room where we put the extra stuff that still needs some work. And the reason I came in here, in college I decided I really like to work big on some of my work and I made my own frames, similar to what I'm going to be doing today. So I'm looking forward to this. This is really going to be fun. And in the meantime, as you can see, we have some extra pieces, parts here. So things that I want to quickly move in and out of the room, like lighting stands. And I've also got a tripod. So that'll make it really easy for me to just set up, shoot a short video, take it all apart, move it back in here and go right back to voiceover. So today we're going to be building some acoustic panels. And to that end, I've set up my workspace ahead of time. There's some wood back paneling for each of the panels. And then those planks you see there are one by three fur that'll be used to build the frame. The frame for the panel is going to have fabric stretched over that's in that plastic bag. And we have a very special pair of scissors that's only used for cutting fabric to make a nice clean cut and we've got a tape measure and then since I'm working with cloth I've cleaned this area and I've laid a blanket down to keep it from getting dust and dirt while I'm working I don't want to hang dirty panels I'm going to be building a four foot by six foot panel and then a series of two foot by four foot panels and to that end I've got a compressor with two different kinds of nail guns. One of them is going to be finishing nails and the other is going to be staples. So we'll use finishing nails to put the frame together and we'll use staples to stretch the canvas tight. Well, I call it canvas. It's actually a very porous, breathable fabric. It has a print on the top of it, but it actually has holes in the fabric like burlap. So that's how that's designed is that the fabric with the holes in it will allow sound to pass through and inside the panels is going to be this Roxol Rockwool safe and sound insulation. 
Okay, so now I'm set up for cutting. And the way this works is to make a two by four piece, the long ends are gonna be four feet exactly. And the short ends, the two feet, are gonna be just slightly less. So it's gonna be less the thickness of those side pieces. That way I create an even space on the inside that's 23 inches by 47 inches. Because each of these pieces are about a half an inch thick. In order to do that, I've prepped the chop saw out here at the end so it's easier to sweep up whatever sawdust doesn't get caught in that bag on the back of it. I'm gonna make straight even cuts. I looked into the possibility of 45 degree, but the way this wood is, it's possible that the nails I would use would split. So I want a nice solid fit on the corners and no one's gonna see it. It's gonna be covered over with cloth. So right now, the important thing is when I make my cuts, they need to be straight. So I've got a couple of pieces here balanced so that every plank that I feed in is going to be pretty level. None of these wood pieces are perfect. One by three fur is typically used for random little fill-ins. And so they're just kind of cheap wood, but that's okay because for me, I just needed to be able to hold the canvas together and keep the insulation in place. And I keep calling it canvas because I was an artist, you know, I've done that. What I'm really referring to is a material that, when I said it was porous, I mean that it's an open weave fabric. Let's take a look at it here for a moment. So an open weave fabric is burlap or something like it. If you look really close, and it may not be easy to see, but even though this has a print on it, the material itself has huge gaps between each of the thread spaces. So it's thinner than canvas. It's not as open as burlap, but it's still an open weave, and that should work for us to capture the sound. So as I cut each of these pieces, whenever I have little spares, I'll use those to shore up all of my boards and keep them level. And the chop saw just works straight down. And you want to get the blade spinning, then lower it on the board and bring it back out again. And only then do you let off the trigger and let the blade slow. Otherwise, it's going to kick on you. Most people know that, but just in case you didn't, that's kind of how it works. So furring wood isn't perfect, and what I'm doing to make sure that I get a decent cut is every time I put a board in and I'm ready to go, I check it with a level just to make sure. And if it's not quite right, like if it's bowed a little bit one way, I'll flip it and try it the other and just adjust it a bit. These cuts don't have to be perfect, but I should get as close as possible because it's going to make my life easier. The other thing about it is that they're all supposed to be eight foot boards, but again, this is random cheap finishing wood or furring strips, so what I'll do is I measure each cut exactly. I don't just assume that the board is an even eight feet. That could trip me up too. And as you can see, I've cut a couple pieces, and so now I have the ability to make a little ledge that's nice and level. I'm gonna continue cutting now, and let's see what we get. Okay, so I had to stop by the store because I was off by one board, but I've got enough insulation for a few more panels, so I figured I'd go ahead and maybe make a few more. So in the meantime, I wanted to give you some advice for picking good 1x3 fur. If it's still in the bundle, it's going to work a lot better because it's probably still pressed down tight and less likely to have warped. But you pick up the board and you look down it, and what you're looking for is, does it do too much of this or too much of that? Or in particular, you can see the thing will corkscrew if it's not very good. This one's not too bad, but then the other thing you do is you look down the end of it, and you notice there's a little bit of bowing there. It's okay to have a little, because this is not the best wood in the world. You want to make sure it's not super bent. So, one way you can do that is you can lay this down on the ground, and then you just kind of tap it. And if it's only got a little bit of give, it's not that bad. What you don't want, some of these pieces can be really, really bowed. All right, that said, I'm gonna get back to my cutting, and then I'll show you what I've got once I've cut all of my pieces, my side pieces. Oh yeah, one other quick note. These panels were perfect because I needed two by four. I just bought a couple of four by eight panels, and while I was at the store, I asked them to cut the panels for me. So I got these nice clean cuts with a really big professional saw. It took them about two minutes to do, and they fit in my car a lot easier. Okay, it's a little after 10 o'clock on a Florida morning, and boy, is it hot. Anyhow, I finished my four by six piece, and I've cut enough pieces for eight acoustic panels. 
The goal here is I'm going to start with five or maybe six, depending how much cloth and insulation I have. And then we'll test the room and see if it needs more treatment. And if so, I can always buy more cloth and we'll go from there. But in the meantime, this should cover exactly how much rock will I have and leave just a little bit left to spare. And I have other projects I can put these pieces to use on. At the end, I just had one last piece of board foot. So there we go. That's probably about not quite three feet long. Looking good. Now it's time to build the frames. So I've got all my pieces cut nice and neat here for all of the panels. And that's the taco truck right on time. That's who's honking. So what I'm going to do is I've got a T-square that'll help me make sure I get my angles a nice neat 90 degrees. And I'm going to build the four foot by six foot first. Once I build that, I'll have a nice solid right angle and I can just kind of line my other pieces up against that right angle as I drive the nails and I'll have a pretty good larger scale T-square to use for all my 2x4 panels. Over there is the compressor. We got to connect it and let it pressurize and get everything ready and then I'll show you what it looks like afterwards. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is I've got a right angle inside there making sure the boards are lined at a right angle and then the black metal right angle that you see on the outside is designed to keep one board lined up with the other. I have to use the garage wall as a backstop because when the nail gun fires it's going to push with a lot of pressure and it's going to hit those really hard and I want to make sure my nails are straight when I do it. Lined up. So I've got a pretty good system here going and just to give you an idea of what I do, the concrete wall is my backstop but I know that concrete wall is uneven so I use my board to be kind of an even brace for it and then when I get ready to nail it over here in the corner I use the right angle and I make sure I've physically lined up the uh, two boards and then this black one I'll put along here to make sure that the edge is properly flat and then I'll keep an eye on the board itself to make sure it's not tilted and that these two boards meet perfectly. And then I drive the nails in from this side up against the backstop. And I'll do this to both of the corners. Then I'll flip it over. And I'll take the nailed side, put it over there against the wall, and this unnailed side will repeat the same process one corner after another until I'm done. That gives me a pretty even frame. But there's still some warping because these aren't perfect pieces. Furring strips are just throwaway, kind of. So, for example, this frame is just a little bit warped in one corner so it lifts. That's not going to be a big deal. Once I get everything on and in place, the canvas is going to help stretch it a little tighter, the material. But even then, it doesn't have to be perfect because the flat piece that I'm putting up against the back is going to, be, is going to help it attach to the wall and if it bows out a little bit from the wall, it's not the end of the world. Still, I think these are going to come in pretty flat. Okay, so we're done with the panels at least. Now we're ready to go ahead and put the fabric across them. And that's going to be fun. I just wanted to show you and give you a thought or two about the nail gun. First off, the nail gun I had to replace the other one with doesn't have a safety on it. That bothered me. So you have to be really careful. Don't point that in any direction where it could hit something that you'd be bothered by. The other thing is when I line up with my square there, sometimes the temptation may be to try to hold the corner steady with your hands, especially if there's a slight warp to it. If you're going to do that, you need to keep your hands well out of the path of that nail. Because even if the nail goes in perfectly straight and doesn't bend, if it hits a knot hole anywhere along the way, it might ricochet right out the side. 
So I'm using two inch nails. If I had to have my hands on the angle to hold it steady because there was a bend in the wood, then I made sure my hands were three inches or more back just to at least minimize the possibility that anything might hit it. But I advise against that if you can avoid it. So now it's time for the fabric. I'm going to set up for that. Okay, so now I'm at the point where I'm working with the fabric and the first and most important piece is the four foot by six foot. If I run out on my last two by four, no big deal, but the ceiling cloud is a priority. So here's what I've done. Oh, that's just charming. It's not an ice cream truck, but it is a taco truck. Anyhow, this here is enough overlap to give me the room to cut the pattern. I deliberately chose a pattern that's fairly chaotic and doesn't have an easy to find rhythm to it because I don't want these panels to all look uneven if they're not perfectly lined up. And then when I cut the slack for the four foot by six foot, I made a nice straight line across the edge. This material didn't come to me perfectly cut, so I had to kind of try to get it lined up as best I can so that I have enough slack for everything and then cut it. So one other thing I'll mention is I'm going to staple the fabric on the inside of the board because that way, but the panels that do have a backing, they won't be sitting on top of staples. The staples will be underneath. We moved indoors to go ahead and start putting the material across the frame and we were very slow. I got help from my wife Karen who has done upholstery before because what she's doing right now is neatening the corners, tucking them in so that they don't really have an obvious fold to them. We've got plenty of material. We've got it stretched nice and tight. And this is the ceiling cloud. The other pieces will be easier because they're smaller, but they still require us to go slowly, take our time, and get the corners just right. It's also important to have it on a nice flat surface so that you can stretch it taut. The 4x6 piece turned out really good, so now as we go down the roll, we're just getting 2x4 pieces using a straight edge to set a mark, and then cutting all of the individual pieces that we'll then put together one by one. All right, so we've got the frames all got the cloth stretched on them, and now we're insulating. So as you can see, the four foot by six we're doing first, and that has the rock wool insulation. So we put the loosest possible simple burlap across the top, just to contain the particulates that are in the insulation. So that said, we'll be ready to hang the ceiling cloud, but first we're gonna move on to the two by four panels. All right, thank goodness we're done. These are most of the panels, just showing that we've got them all stacked up nice and neat with the backing boards tacked on. And there's our ceiling cloud. We'll get to hanging those and move on from here. So now I'm hanging the panels on the wall. And in order to do that, I want it to be really close. I can't get it flush very easily, but I've got a very simple trick for that. Down here, are a pair of mirror hangers. And I put one on the wall and I put one on the back of the unit. Let's see if I can focus on that for you. So these these are designed to interlock. Actually the real purpose is you hang them on the wall in a way that lets you put a piece of mirror paneling up against the wall like in a bathroom mirror. But for me I just take one and flip it over and they make a nice little hook that'll let you hang it and at the same time be very flat because it's not very tall. It doesn't stick out from the wall very much. I'm a little limited in where I can position my panels because I'm needing to go on the studs. They need to go into the studs. So I can't put them exactly where I'd like but I'll try to get close and I'll stagger where the hangers are in order to get my panel scooted a little bit closer to my liking. So one other thing is that as I go, I make sure everything's level. When I put the brackets on the back of the panel and on the wall, I double check and make sure that I've adjusted them in a way that's going to be level and lines up neatly. And I do the same at the top. I want to make sure that from one panel to another, it's going to be a nice level line by the time I get done so that everything just looks really neat. All right, 
I'm liking the way this wall looks. I got these three inches apart from each other, and then just a few inches, uh, not quite a foot away from the sound curtain. This is where I'm going to be recording, so the mic stand goes right here. I'm looking forward to that. That horrible noise you hear is temporary. They're just putting in a pool today for our neighbors. So that's not something I'm going to have to contend with on a regular basis. All right, let's move on. So as I put the pieces on the back, the little hanger clips, I also take measurements, make sure it's exactly as far down as it needs to be in the part where it catches, lines up exactly where I expect it to be with the corresponding piece that's on the wall. Working on the ceiling cloud, getting the hooks in to hang it from, it's going to hang down about six inches, and it's six inches out from the wall. I'm kind of at the mercy of the studs as to where I can place my hooks, though. Sometimes it could be 16 inches on center. One of those over there to the right is actually 23, so there's a lot of play there. But eventually, I'm going to get the front row here, be very meticulous about the back row, and punch those in. And then we'll use some wire and hooks to hang the four foot by six foot ceiling cloud. All right, so my acoustic panels are done and I've hung the ceiling cloud. Let's take a look. Got my panels, got my green screen, and then up here in the ceiling, hanging six inches down. I'm kind of proud of that. It's level on the long axis and a little bit tilted on the short axis, and that's okay. So as you can see, I've got my mic stand here, and I can use either of these mics, and I can work on there. Then I just take the Surface Pro off and sit down in the editing area, and I can sit there and work with my monitors <laughs> kind of close to my face, but I may make some changes to that later. And meanwhile, I've got the ceiling cloud over my head while I work. So that's going to sound really good. The room is definitely a lot quieter. There's a huge difference, especially if you step from under the ceiling to under the cloud. So I got to do some sound checks, but I can't do it right now because there's construction going on outside. Maybe later on tonight when they end for the day, I'll do some sound checks and send them off to George, see what he thinks and go from there. Oh, hey, one other little trick that I thought about. When I thought about whether I would need to treat these closet doors because they would be a flat surface with reflected sound, based on what George was telling me about how acoustics work, I have these things that I hang all the random little home theater, computer, audio cables and stuff in. They're actually for shoes, but it came in really handy when I realized I had a lot of coax and other stuff on my hands. Anyway, the point is they're soft, and what I can do is put them right here and turn them, and they can also kind of act as a little bit of a baffle. We'll see how that works when we do a sound check, and I'll get his opinion on that. But it might be really useful while I'm recording. <laughs> 